Hello, everyone. This is part two, and we are discussing All In, which will be in Wembley Stadium. Um, this is the most important show in AEW history. And at the end of the day, this card is the best card to attract casual fans, hardcore fans, and any kind of fan you can think of. And what was the spirit of All In? The first All In in 2018. The spirit of All In was to have a bunch of wrestling crossover. And that's my inspiration on this card. You know, you had the Ring of Honor stuff. You had stuff for the future. You had New Japan Pro Wrestling stuff. You had many unique things there. So I kind of want to make this show feel like that. So, on the buy-in, just one match. You know, nothing too crazy like the other buy-in, but something still good for the people who aren't paying for the pay-per-view. Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager from JAS versus Jack Perry and Rev Pros and the UK's own Michael Oku. I think Michael Oku is an incredibly talented um, wrestler, and I feel like you could have hit, you know, you could do something here. You could try to do a little crossover here, and I think it'd be a great thing for the buy-in. Now, the main show. The opener, let's start off with a hot technical match. Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. They would go at it. They would go to war. But the winner would be Brian Danielson. And after the match, Brian Danielson will try to ambush Zack Sabre Jr. with Claudio and Yuta. But then the one who comes to make the save is Kota Ibushi. And that what happens? A mega announcement. The following week, in seven days, it'll be Brian Danielson versus Kota Ibushi at All Out in Chicago. In seven days. I mean, that sounds awesome. That sounds more fun to watch. Yeah. I'm honestly in the same with Bourbon, dude. You can't really say much about that, Chief. Now, match two. AEW Trio's championship match. House of Black, which I, th I don't know um, specifically where all three of them are. But, you know, it, I feel like it, the House of Black could still get a good pop there. And then their opponents would be Mark Briscoe and the Lucha Brothers. So, think about it. Mark Briscoe and the Lucha Brothers have been a very fun trio, and it makes sense because Pac has kind of gone full ballistic mode with the hammer, hammer and stuff. Time. And I know Lucha Bros have kind of used the hammer here and there too, but Pac was the one who was the main influence behind that mentality, and Mark kind of influences the good in Lucha Brothers. So eventually, we could definitely do a Mark Briscoe and Pac feud, but that's for a later day. We're talking about today: House of Black versus Mark Briscoe and the Lucha Brothers. You can have a strong babyface trio there, but in the end, the House of Black continue their reign of dominance and retain. I think that'd be good. I think they're only going to get a nice pop because the House of the members are from the UK. So it makes so much sense to have that. So they're going to have a nice pop. I think this is going to be a fun match to watch. Definitely a good trio to watch. I uh, will be to see. Uh, happy to see House of Black keep their dominance alive. Yeah, and I also too like how you have uh, King kind of pinning Phoenix so that way you can protect Mark Briscoe, so you don't make him look like um, well, not a joke necessarily, but you kind of protect him just a little yeah. bit since he's somewhat new to because he's he's mostly in Ring of Honor right now. But I think eventually he'll win that world title from Joe or whoever takes over. So it's a good way to doing that sort of thing. No, yeah, no, I, yeah. You you see what what I'm uh, doing though. Yeah, I don't want Briscoe to be the one who gets pinned. Yeah. I mean, you can have him get pinned, but I don't, I don't really think it would be necessary. So, moving on to the TBS Championship match. Taya Valkyrie, because I said Taya would win at double or nothing. Remember, so this would be a three month title reign. And it would be against the UK's Soraya. 
And think about it like this. Soraya debuted in September of Grand Slam. So 11 months later, she wins her very first championship in UK in a stadium. It would be a glorious moment. I know it. Even though she's a heel, it would be a great moment. And she still has that ring rust in a way. I'm not going to say she's a bad wrestler because I don't think she is. I think she's a really good one. But she kind of still has that ring rust here and there. And I feel like you could really play it safe by giving her the TBS title. And that would be a great way of making that title mean more than it currently is. You know? And even if it goes on to have Valkyrie, I think she could have a solid little reign, you know, like I said, three months. But I don't think... Taya could really do a year-long plus title reign. I don't want to see another long title reign after Jay just had the, you know, infinity long title reign that he has had. And I would rather do some short reigns, you know, make that title mean a bit more. And I know I bitched about the TNT title doing that, but the difference is, is that the TNT title constantly changes without purpose or reason. I feel like if you had the TBS title change hands at double or nothing, and then do it again at All In, both times would have a purpose behind it. Double or Nothing would be the end of Jade streak, and that's how you can make Taya a bigger star. So when she does lose to Soraya three months later in the UK, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. And both moments would be big and mean something and have purpose and reason behind it. That's just my way of viewing it. Yeah. To me, that'll be fun. I can't wait to see that happen. And there's everyone's bugging pop for Soraya just because of the she's from the UK too, so it makes perfect sense. And it's happy to see Ty Bakri having that title coming over there. I think it's going to be fun to watch. So I'm happy with Soraya winning. Yeah, and if anything too, hopefully they keep Jay Garkel out of the TBS title for a hot minute because you need to kind of build more legitimacy because well, for like the longest time the TBS title doesn't really mean anything. My idea for Jade Cargill is, I would, like, you know how I said I'd have her lose twice, once at Double or Nothing, then at Forbidden Door? Mm-hmm. I'd have her disappear at for, after Forbidden Door without saying a word, without anything, right? So I'd let her be gone for a good five or six months, maybe almost the entire rest of 2023. Mm-hmm. And during that meantime, she can train, she can improve, and, you know, when she comes back, like I said, she has the look. She has the capability of being a superstar. All she really needs is more of that in-ring um, ability. So she went away for six months in privacy and, and went quiet for those six months and focused in on that training. I think she could come back and be a bigger deal and a better wrestler. And that's actually how it would go about the Jade Cargill thing. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So, um, all right, match number four. I don't even need to speak for this one, but I will just say a few things. IWGP United States Championship match, Will Ospreay versus Jay White. Will Ospreay is like the UK's own, so he'd get the big pop, of course, out of these two. And basically, this would be right after Will Ospreay beats Kenny. And Will Ospreay is going to be going on a redemption arc. He's going to win the G1. He's going to do all the things he said he needed to do after he lost to Kennedy. Not Kennedy, Kenny. Remember when, after he lost to Kennedy in January, he said he has one more year, one more year left in his contract. He has to win the G1 and the championship. That's his goal. That's exa- exactly what I would allow to happen. So to continue that dominance, that reign of dominance, he would beat Jay White here. But don't worry, Jay White fans. This would be the only Jay White loss I would book in all of 2023. And I would allow him to continue his, uh, you know, to rack up those wins and maybe win a championship in the future, the next year, maybe. To, because we got to allow people to get familiar with Jay White, you know? So that's, that's basically my way of looking at it. I think this would be a tremendous match. I don't need to say much more. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. And I think I'm okay with the Jay White with uh, losing it. If it's just one loss, and it makes sense for Will Ospreay just to get his his stuff back, winning the J1 and everything. I can't wait to see that stuff. I'm going to be watching that stuff. And it should be, even if, it should be a great match to watch. There's no doubt in my mind. It should be a fun match to watch. So definitely I'm okay with Will Ospreay winning that. 
Yeah, I'm perfectly okay with this. Build more legitimacy for Will Osprey and JY can take a loss. It's fine. It's not like he's going to lose, like, quite frankly, even after winning the Owen Hart Cup tournament. So, you know, it's good. Yeah, like I already set the two up for some success, you know? So, now let's move on. Sting's retirement tour. Now, this one, I wrote more with my heart than with my mind. But it makes sense. Sting's retirement tour. Jeff Hardy versus Sting. This would be Jeff Hardy's, Jeff Hardy's chance to redeem that moment from Victory Road in 2011. And you guys know what I'm talking about. It was a painful, painful night for those Impact fans, TNA fans. And this would be the only chance Jeff would ever get to redeem that fuck up. It is up to him to take it. If not, I'll just throw someone else at Sting. Like Jack Perry. Yeah. yeah. I think it makes perfect sense. There's it would be fun to watch. It's uh, I hope nothing bad happens during that the way to that match if that does happen. And it makes sense staying winning with his retirement to work. Makes sense. Yeah, because if honestly, because I'm a little familiar with the TNA aspect, it was kind of unfortunate that we never got that dream match because, you know, Jeff Hardy was kind of going through that whole drug problem. Like, that was real bad. And for now, he seems sober. So hopefully this could be like a good, you know, comeback to the story. Yeah, I think it'd be inspirational, even if Jeff Hardy lost. It's, it's like shit. He got the match. Or let's do the same shit again. It's like, that was bullshit. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, an intermission from the action. So, uh, all out in Chicago, MJF is getting an AEW championship match. So, I didn't book him on all in. But that doesn't mean I can't have him not show up at all. So, he would pull up with a microphone, talk some shit, and he would get interrupted not once, but twice. Remember how the, at the first pay-per-view in AEW history, MGF interrupted the uh, hitman Bret Hart? How about if this time Bret Hart interrupted him? And then this is going to probably require a lot of money, but I don't care. It's worth it. I would bring in Ric Flair. Imagine a Ric Flair and MJF promo, even today. It would be incredibly entertaining. And how would it end? With MJF beating up Ric Flair and Bret Hart to the point where they're both bleeding on the floor. So you just have these two old men, these two old legends, bleeding all, like, all over the ring. And then he gets saved by a new debuting star. And I have two pitches here. Number one, Drew Galloway. That, that one makes all the sense in the world. You guys don't even need to explain that one. But that is if and only if WWE cannot get a new deal with Drew McIntyre. Now, number two, there are rumors swirling around after Josh Alexander dropped or relinquished the Impact Championship. He could be headed to AEW. I don't know how true those rumors are. I've heard them here and there. But if it is a possibility, I would bring him in. And I would have him be the guy to come in and save the legends. So I gave you guys two names right there. Drew Galloway and Josh Alexander. And no matter what name, it would make for a really cool moment in my head. Yeah, to me, I would say the same thing. I would love to see that happening. It would be funny. The Chris would love to see the Rick Flair getting in beat, beaten up brutal. That's what he likes to see. Okay. To see how old men die. You know what's so, funny, Bourbon? Yeah, it's, yeah, it is funny, but still messed up. But I think it would be fun to see Drew Galloway or Josh Alexander come back. I was like, come to become a uh, all elite. That would be interesting. I think Josh Alexander would be the bigger would be the bigger one that has a bigger possibility to be there than Drew, I feel like. But I think it would be awesome to see myself. Yeah, that just sounds like money. That just sounds amazing, Daniel. 
This sounds so funny just seeing a Ric Flair just get his ass kicked in a huge ass stadium in front of 70,000 people. Marty. Hi, MJF with the diamond ring. Yep. It's perfect. It's beautiful, man. Now back to the action. We got the barbed wire death match. The match to officially end the feud. You can make it exploding. You could do whatever, but make it the most brutal match humanly possible. Adam Page versus John Moxley 5. The final match. The final match, okay, people? So here's the thing. Match 4 happened, the Texas death match, and it was brutal. But here's the thing. I know we can get more brutal. So... I want this. I want the ropes to be covered in barbed wire. I want this to be fucking crazy. They pissed off the internet with the last match. Pissed them off even more with this one. That's my answer to that. Oh, and who wins? Adam Page, brother. Yeah, to me, that's what I, I would love to see. Uh, this match again, I would love to kind of maybe make it a lot bigger than a barbed wire death match, and it could. And I don't know if they have, if they can ever do it. I would like to see an electric barbed wire death match. To me, that sounds more fun to see. I don't think I don't, I don't have, I've never heard of it before myself, but it sounds more fun to have like the wires electric electrified. So uh, barbed wires by the rings, the the wires around the ring will be electrified. So if they get shocked, to me it'd be fun to watch. I would love to see uh, Paige win myself, too. Yeah, same here. I mean, if they don't do electric barbed wire, they could just pretend Berman. They're good at that. Uh, even if it's a barbed wire death match, it's perfectly fine, but I think it'd be fun if they could add a little bit more to make it something that we've never seen before without being electric barbed wire. Explosion barbed wire death match. No, that's... <laughs> they did bad... They did bad Bad job last time, so. It was still a good match, though. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. I think just no matter what, make it violent, and that's all that matters. And, yeah, now we get into the next matchup here. Uh, match number seven, AEW Women's Championship match. Jamie Hayda versus Mercedes Monet. I said what I said at Forbidden Door, and it makes sense to do the match here. I know it would cost a lot of money to do this, but guess what? You pay that fucking money, and you make it happen, Mr. Billionaire. <laughs> that would be fun. I think it did that. Another thing would be fun to watch. I think. Uh, this should be a fun match. I hope there's no botches or nothing about that. So... For me, I'm not happy to see Jamie here to win that match, too. I, I know I kind of want Mercedes money to win, but I know they can't do that. But, you know, Jamie Hayter taking the W is fine. Because literally, this will be the match of, you know, of all in. I'm down for it. It's just going to add a lot, a lot of contribution. It's probably going to be the, the sickest women's match we're going to see from this card. And it would probably be the, the biggest women's match AEW's ever done. Mm hmm. So. <laughs> That's yeah, more depth to this card. Definitely. Now, this next match, I know you guys won't want it to happen, but think about it. We're trying to fill in 90,000 people, trying to fill in an entire stadium. This name has value. What does it? And brings in the American what does it? people. No, I mean the UK people. Think about it. This guy sells out a lot of stadiums, you could say. What does it? Phil Goldberg. Versus Wardlow in Goldberg's retirement match. Goldberg is pissed off at WWE for not giving him his retirement match, and he wants his retirement match no matter what. But if he's going to do it, I want him to do it while playing over a new talent. Why not play over Wardlow? So you could just make it a quick match, you know. Spear, spear, jackhammer, power bomb, spear, spear. You know, you could just do all that bullshit. But what Wardlow gets to win, that's what matters most. And we give Goldberg a stupid retirement match and he can go away. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I can't. We, uh, me, I'm not 
happy with seeing if they had put Goldberg, but if they wanted to, they could easily do it, make it. It's just a big pop in the arena every time, and you can hear Goldberg inside the arena and everything, so it'd be fine. At least, and then the war, though. It makes sense to me, I'm okay with it. At least it should be, I just hope it's a really quick, a fairly quick match, at least, so I'm okay with what yeah, we're doing. I'm it not, would be. I'm not happy with this match. It's stupid. And you know it's a waste of money. But I understand you have to bring in Oldberg to bring in the crowds of boomers that actually care about this stupid job. But you know, it's whatever. You know what needs to happen, yeah. It's like, I don't want to book the match, but it has to happen. Can you just make that the opener? Nope. <laughs> make this your piss break match, butter. You, you can't just have Jamie Hayter versus Mercedes Money be match of the year, and they're just like, all right, book it. Get Goldberg yeah, and Warlow. Think about it. Think about it. It might be so big, we might need to take a shit or piss after that match. That's the perfect match, then. It's going to be less than two minutes. <laughs> it's like, you know, think about it like this, right? You're going to eat some delicious, amazing lasagna <laughs> with Mercedes versus Jamie, and then you're going to be like, oh, I need to take a shit. <laughs> then Goldberg versus Wardlow comes on, and it's like, oh, perfect timing. Yeah, a good, a good, a good shitty match. Yeah, Thank now you do you understand my point, Chris? The lasagna is not even that good. <laughs> just, just go with my fucking point. No. You know what I'm talking about. Fine, pineapple pizza for you, you weirdo. That, that's bad, man. <laughs> I'd rather take the lasagna personally. It yeah, sounds good too. But hey. Well, that's debate in our time, Chris. <laughs> now, triple threat match for the AEW Championship. Darby Allen versus Pac versus Adam Cole, baby! So, think about it like this. Remember how Adam Cole got injured? It was in a heavyweight championship match. It wasn't an AEW championship match, but it was for a world championship. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, he can look at the AEW Championship, and he wants redemption by getting that title and basically responding to his injury. But then, there would also be a heel pack waiting for that AEW Championship. He's tried to get it multiple times, and he wants it now. But then there's Darby Allin who's been the champion, who, win, who won the Four Pillars Fatal 4-Way, who would have beaten Nayato, and now he has to deal with two passionate and angry challengers in Adam Cole and Pac. So you get this intense triple threat. The winner faces MJF the following week at All Out, and the winner out of these three would be Darby Allen. So the following week's main event at All Out would be confirmed. Darby Allen versus MJF, the sequel to Full Gear 2021. But this time, the second match will be longer. It'll be better. And it'll be even more intense. Yeah. I think that'd be pretty fun. And there's nothing about it to me. I would love to see this match. This match sounds really great. Darby Allen winning, Darby Allen winning is one of the biggest ones, too, for me. You see, I love seeing Darby Allen. Yeah, and just having be Pac and Adam. Wait, no, Adam Cole didn't fight in this one. I'm I'm dumb. I misread it. I thought it's like, wait, why is Adam Cole in two different matches? And I saw no, Adam Page. No, no, I, I just saw the thing. But I'm cool with it. You can never go wrong with a trios championship match. But we know what the real yeah. main event is, man. Yeah, that's why it's not the main event. The main event. If if I'm I'm saying this has to happen. There's no other match that will be bigger than this match to main event in the UK. CMFTR versus the Elite. The drama they, they, this has become has become so huge that if you do not have this match main event at all in, no matter what other match it will be, it will be considered a disappointment. Yeah, I would say the same thing. It would be a disappointment to see just not see this match. It is a dream match to see, and I should think it would be a great match to see at the same time too. So they can uh, hope they can just 
split, sorry, be okay with each other for just one night and then just go back to hate each other at the, the next night. Like, it's just, please just have this match for one night and then just start hating each other at the end. That's all. Come on, guys. Be, be, be good sports for the, for the company. So, I'm okay with the Elite winning myself, too. Yeah, boy, if this match ever does happen, if it ever happens, it would be amazing, but but we'll see. This is fantasy booking after all, so we'll, we'll have to see if this actually comes to fruition or whatnot. Daniel, how likely is this to actually happen? Like, low-key. Like, honestly, how likely is this to actually happen? I'm going 50-50 at the moment because I do have my <laughs> idea. Because part of me thinks that I'm not going to call this shit a work. It's not a work. It's clearly all not a work, but there's one thing I will say. I do think it is possible that they could have talked things out already and the Elite and Tony Khan are working the dirt sheets and they're writing false information, possibly. I'm not saying it's true, but it could be a possibility. AEW has done this before. They've stirred the dirt sheets in a way to make them think something won't happen, but then it does happen. And, you know, why would AEW do this, is your question. Well, they don't want to ruin the surprise if it does happen. That's All true. of this drama for the public has made us want the match even more. Yeah, well, I think that makes sense. Well, I think it makes sense for him, for uh, Tony Khan to do that, too. Yeah. Now, this is part three. I was all in. What do you guys think of this all-in card? This one's definitely my favorite. So far, we have to get to the third video, but this one definitely has more of the entertaining matches, I would say, yeah. not to discount yeah, New me Japan. Too. Yeah, me too. I really like this. I really like the card myself right here. I would hope so, because this show has to be AEW's best and biggest show of all time, because it's, from an audience standpoint, going to be the biggest. Their first stadium show, not just a stadium show, like Dr. Ash, that was only 24 Wembley is 90,000. They may never do something this big ever again. They have got to book the best show ever for this show. The best ever. Yeah, that's 100% what they need to do. Like, they need to make this the WrestleMania 3 of AEW. And what do you, and you're probably questioning, what do you mean by that? It, remember how WrestleMania 3 had like over 90,000 people, and for a long time, it was like the biggest wrestling show ever? Mm hmm. That show basically made WrestleMania WrestleMania. Like, sure, WrestleMania 1 was a success, and so was WrestleMania 2, kind of. Not really, but kind of. So, but WrestleMania 3 is what made WrestleMania feel like the Super Bowl of wrestling. That's what solidified it by selling out a stadium with over 90,000 people. AEW need to accomplish that same exact thing to be here to stay and be a competitor to WWE. If they want to be taken seriously, they got to sell this out. I'm sure they will, yeah. honestly, because they're already at... I'm pretty sure they're already like at 80,000. I could be incorrect about that, but the ticket sales that, are like... I believe I believe the pre-sale is at 60,000, so two-thirds, which, think about it, though. They still have four months, so that's pretty impressive if all 60,000 buy it which may not be the case because some are like scalpers who like to buy multiple tickets and sell them mm -hmm. and all that shit. But, you know, it's definitely a good number for, you know, early now, 60,000. That's a good number. Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully what AEW has to do is they have to put on good wrestling shows leading into all, all in. So people will be convinced to buy those tickets. That's what has to happen. They got to make Dynamite good. They gotta make Collision good. They gotta make Forbidden Door a must-see show. They gotta make Double or Nothing as good as Revolution was. They gotta go all out, no pun intended, with these shows in order to make AEW a company that is worth something. Instead of what will a lot of people predict to be another Impact Wrestling, which was once huge and then kind of became another indie company, which isn't a bad thing. But think about it. This could be the show that puts AEW on a higher level. And that's something that has to be taken consideration for. We have to be careful with how we book this card. 
like Punk versus Jericho. It could be fun. It could be great. I'm not denying it, but it's not going to do the same as CM FTR versus the Elite. It's not. Yeah, probably not. But it could sell out the show right there. So that was the card. Thank you all so much for watching part two. We'll be doing the final part, which will be all out in Chicago. Take it easy.